Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I've always wondered what it was like to live in South Africa during apartheid. That's when the parliament passed laws that separated people by race, determined where they could live, where they could go, and what they could do. There's no one better able to describe living in her homeland, a country that she loved, but came to fear when she chose to fight the injustices she saw. And that's my friend, Jeanette Carlson, who is my guest today. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to make two things very clear from the get-go. All right. Um, one is that in the times we are talking about pre-1960s and 70s, there was obviously no internet. <laughs> and everything that happened was therefore it never went around the world in two seconds and the, and the country in one second. Everything had to be word of mouth, if you were lucky, in the newspapers. So if there was an uprising in one part of, of South Africa, you know, unless you were there and there was a journalist there, you never got to hear about it. So the internet made a huge difference. And that was, that was when the press was really important. Newspapers. Correct. So you grew up in South, you were born in South Africa. I was born in South Africa and um, I grew up like any other South Africans. Uh, let me briefly say, we grew up with servants at one's beck and call. There was always at least one female servant who was in charge of keeping the house clean, doing the cooking, doing the laundry, taking care of the children, and seeing that everything worked. If you lived in a house and not an apartment, there was a male domestic who did the garden, the swimming pool, polished the floors, cleaned the cars, and did all that. So that, um, they worked, I would say, from what I remember, from 6.30 in the morning till yeah, about 8 after dinner. If we had guests, it would be 9 or 10. But that was the period of time. They would have one afternoon a week off, occasional Sundays if there weren't extra guests for the owners, and um, two weeks vacation a year. The salary was an absolute pittance because ostensibly there was food in the kitchen and their accommodation, such as it was, was paid for by the owners. So they earned very little in the way of money. Um, one grew up therefore only knowing blacks as servants right. doing whatever they were told to do. If they were working in the city, in businesses, at the end of the working day, <coughs> they would go off to the townships into which they were segregated and were not allowed to remain in the city. The most important thing that an African had, male and female, the most important thing was called a pass. This was not a government um, document. It could be written by the 13-year-old in the house saying, so-and-so has my permission to be out of the house and will be back when she's finished doing what she is supposed, what she needs to go and do. It was called a pass. Any African who was asked for his, her, his not so much her at that time. Black African. Yes. Black African. Yes. We only called... Africans, oh, bl the bl black people. called black people uh -huh. Africans. And what about the coloreds? Well, that the was coloreds another category. were colored. I'll get yeah. to them because that's how the black sash started. Yeah. All right. I, <laughs> so you grew up, uh, let, me, let me do the interview. Yeah. I don't want you to do the interview. Okay. <laughs> All right. You, you ask. Okay. You grew up in this environment. Yes. So you didn't really realize the injustice of it all. Oh, absolutely just, uh, not. not. These yeah. people were there to see that yeah. I had clean clothes yeah. and a nice warm bath when it was time but to bath. But you were always nice to them anyway. Yeah, <laughs> well, it depended. Yeah. You know, if they said it's time to go to sleep and I was playing a game, I might say, I don't, I don't want to go and uh -huh. sleep, but That's, whatever, yeah. so on it, the whole. It wasn't until you went to a school to train as a kindergarten teacher, a nursery school teacher, 
that something snapped when you were doing the internship or what, what, we, what, what we would call an internship where you were teaching in municipal schools. Yeah. What happened was, A, I had some periods of time at African schools in the townships and the sight of what that place was like was such an eye opener and by then I was 18, 19, Soldiers had come back from the war talking about what it was like to live, to be in a place where this didn't, didn't happen. happen. There was all sorts of political talk going on and I was listening to all this and really learning from it and also meeting all sorts of other people, friends of ones I was working with and their friends. So my vision was expanding. One of the people I met was my future husband Joel and we married in about 1953 and we lived in an apartment in Hilbro which was um, a white area but obviously full of blacks, full of Africans because um, we all had servants mm -hmm. and even in my apartment on my own you had. I had a woman who came in cleaned, made the beds, cleaned the bathrooms, cooked if we wanted, whatever we wanted, and so on. And um, there was a lot of political talk, certainly not in my home. That was, it wasn't that it was banned, it just mm. never happened. Was it the same thing when Joel grew up, your husband? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, and he but had, he was in a private house. I, was, I grew up in a school that uh, my parents were running. He, he had a similar kind of thing, didn't he? Because he became an, a lawyer. Oh, no, he, before he became a lawyer, I think, he was doing some work oh, in the court system, at, right? At university, he yeah. was very involved in uh -huh. students for right. uh, whatever. whatever it yeah. was. Um, so both of you overcame your backgrounds. Absolutely. To see the injustice that was going on. Joel went on to be an attorney who represented a black people, a lot of black people. Yes. And what did you do? <laughs> I remained as a teacher, but by then I had, had started having children. I began to sense that there was a really weird feeling. On the one hand, you have these people who do everything for you, and yet you are supposed to think of them as being stupid and ignorant. And the two things just don't mesh together. The other thing was the fact that we never, ever saw Africans in a social mm. manner. But as I grew older, I began meeting people who were much more left-wing, mm -hmm. much more progressive, and they had friends, even though uh, there were almost no black students. There were one or two. The most, I think the most important thing about growing up is one has no idea of how black people live. I mean, we had servants. They were married. They had children. Their mm. kids were in the country. But you didn't think Being about looked it. after by, by, the, by their grandparents or mm -hmm. something who didn't have enough to eat or anything else. One had, one, you, you just had no idea because you never ever spoke about it. Well, did Joel start representing black people as a result of the friends that he made in the university? No. 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 He, uh, I'm not exactly sure. He had worked for years in the um, municipality, in the courts. Mm. And he had grown so sick of it, and, and it was so terrible. Two separate systems, basically. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They, I mean, there were no yeah. real courts. It right. was just a question of go to jail or, right. as we later saw, of go to the farms. And he exposed that, didn't he, with his trial? Did. The black but before that happened, <laughs> I was one day traveling in the, in the elevator in our apartment and there was an elderly lady there with a gorgeous, gorgeous cake. And I said to her, wow, that's a great cake. What, where are you taking it? 
And she looked at me like quizzically and decided I was safe and said, well, I'm going to a black sash cake sale. And I said, the black sash? I've been trying to get hold of those people for months. I'd heard about the black sash. There was no sign of them. There were no notices. There was nothing. I said, where are they? I want to join. And she explained. And I went to my first black sash meeting. That was still, I think, while Joel was, was in, the, in the court system. And, I mean, in those days, um, How many? the average age of, of, the, of the people at the meeting was 60. Mm. I was 19 or 20. No, I was 23 then because yeah. I was married. Yeah. I mean, to me, they were like 160. <laughs> what had happened was in, in, in the Cape part of South Africa was where the coloreds lived. Coloreds being uh, Africans who had married whites and their you know, mm. offspring were coloured mm. and so on and so forth. And they were called coloureds and they had the vote. They had mm. the vote like everybody else. And one of the first things this government, this nationalist government did, I think in 1949 when they took over, was take them off the voting list. That, the fact that these blacks, these African people would not be able to vote anymore was not what drove the black sash. What drove them was that they had interfered with the constitution of the country. Mm -hmm. And they started this movement where they met in the Cape and had silent gatherings with a black sash to define the end of the constitution. I was always so taken with that when I was young. I mean, about the same age when I first heard about the black sashes. It just resonated with me, and I every time something happened, I always wanted to do that kind of a thing. And even recently, with the war in Iraq, there was Grandmothers for Peace, and they uh -huh. met every Wednesday in front of Rockefeller Center, and you know, did the, almost. The, but it all came. It was it was fabulous, and of course, this Parliament, which was elected in '49 or '50, I thought uh -huh. it was '50, was a very repressive, very right wing. Parliament. Oh, yes. And very Afrikaner, is that how you put it? Ah, oh, that's true. But what I really wanted to po want to point out was the two things that I think are crucial to knowing about South Africa was one, that the internet wasn't there. Two, that there were always hundreds of people, black and white, women and men, who were against the segregation of the Africans, who were against these terrible laws. So that there was always, I mean, Nelson Mandela was an amazing person who did the most remarkable things. But he had a huge number of people behind him who believed in everything he believed in. And amongst the whites, there were not a lot, but enough to make their presence felt, to demonstrate. And when I joined the Black Sash and ultimately got a lot of my friends and other people in, in Johannesburg anyway, it changed a bit. We got much more out into the streets. We demonstrated once a week in a place, in a, in a kind of you know grassy place very near the university. So students would often come. They knew that we had to be silent. There was no talking, there was no music. Cars would pass because it was a very busy street on the way into the city. They'd either honk and wave their hands or they'd honk and brandish their fists or throw rotten fruit at us or something. But we did it for week after week after week. And it was all and white, known it was it. white. It was white, yeah. only. But the security police never bothered you? Oh. That's one of the things that I noticed when I came here. Um, it's, it's the same in any democratic country, whether South Africa was democratic or not. I came here in 71. I hadn't been here three months 
when I had joined Mothers and Others Against the Draft, Planned Parenthood, ESL, <laughs> you name it, I joined them. <laughs> the major difference was this, and that's where I think South Africa was such a schizophrenic country to live in. The major difference between joining the Black Sash and, and changing, you know, helping mm -hmm. to change that organization from just demonstrating was we had meetings, seminars. There was a huge area, a, a office in all the big, um, in all the big towns where Africans could go when they had trouble with their papers mm -hmm. and there would be people there who would try and help them sort mm -hmm. it out so as they wouldn't be dismissed and sent out of the city mm -hmm. where they were earning a living for their families. Um, I was not prepared to do that because Joel was busy doing it and came home and never stopped talking about it <laughs> at night. So I was not interested in that section. I did keeping the public interested. Mm. But the major difference between joining those groups and doing it here was that when you did it there, there was always the knowledge that you could be arrested at any time. Your phones were all, everybody's phone was tapped. Your mail was opened. You would get mail, especially mail from overseas weeks after it was sent. And it had obviously been opened with a mm -hmm. piece of tape across it, so you would know that. Mm -hmm. um, and you knew yeah. that if you, if you really took the wrong step... Fear. You were with the black sashes and they were following you, and your husband was the lawyer who was in court challenging everything. And um, it was a repressive thing, but you even had... You did have gatherings at your house that included blacks? Because I read the Joel, after a trial, people, if they were yes, acquitted, they would you'd come. have a party at your house. There, there's nothing to stop you. It was just that people never did it. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention about phones being tapped and mail being opened, the worst thing, the really terrible thing, was that you never really knew which of your friends was an informer. Oh. I mean, my closest friends I knew were not. There was just too much intimacy and so mm -hmm. on. But otherwise, you had no idea. For anybody who came to your house, you would say, oh yes, they had liquor when the Africans were there. When those black folk were there, they were drinking liquor. And then you'd be in real trouble. But there were always decisions you had to make. And Joel and I were part of them, and one of them was Ruth First, who had been a member of the Communist Party, I think married to Joe Slova. We had then a very big, big, old, old house with a lot of rooms and a huge basement. And she came one night, one day, and she asked me if, if we could use the house as a station in like a what was house. the equivalent of your mm -hmm. railway, freedom, mm -hmm. whatever right. it was Safe called. Safe houses or whatever it's called. When, yeah. you know, in the time of slavery. Yeah. And I said, I would think about it. And I did. Yeah. And the next day I said to her, I went to her and I said, look, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I've got four kids to bring up right. and I can't leave them to uh, my parents and, and so be arrested. On. And, but I felt terrible about that because you had to make those mm -hmm. decisions all the time. You were not only, the phones were not only tapped, I mean, you were, had gunshots. Yes. At the house, right? Yes. So and they, they just tried to uh, and a uh, bomb blow that was in sent a, to yes. Joel's office. But you know, it didn't go off and we right. redid the windows with special glass and so on. But, but you never, that's why it was like schizophrenic. Mm. You still played tennis, went mm. swimming, <laughs> took your kids here and there, went to the movies, as though nothing was really happening. Yeah, that's so what was so bizarre And about because this. you didn't have the internet, because you had to rely on the press, then you were pressured, I guess, 
to have something that would be covered by the press. Yes. And, and I, I went in this book, which is about Joel and his cases, yeah. not really about you or unfortunately the family, uh, he made a special point to try to get the press. Yeah, and sometimes there was the, the daily paper, morning yeah. paper yeah. was cooperative. But they were never closed down, were they, the no. press? No. Yeah. Right. No, but they also would never really write anything that was that critical, you know. Mm. Um, One of the scandals that you uncovered was when black people are picked up for no pass or some yeah. very little thing, and they would be offered a deal. Oh, no prison farm. if you go work on the farm. And that was indentured. That was slavery. Yeah. They're taken by a farmer. And, and they it could work be for a year. A year. A year. And nobody was concerned about their family or what happened. Oh, no. And there was no notification not. either, was there? No. So people no. were just dumped into prison. Yes, and they just never and, showed up. And a good deal of torture. Yeah. And, and terrible conditions. So yeah. you eventually left. Why? Because it was obvious that the security police were going after Joel. And... Um, we did have one incident. I don't know whether I've got time to tell you. We moved into Five another minutes. house and found, and these are the decisions you have to make, found that the fridge, found quite by accident, the fridge had a trap door underneath it, and we examined it. And you could go down, and there was a space under the, under the floor, and there was air coming in from outside. And we decided it would be a good place to hide, if necessary. And we went to our, we had very, very close friends whom we knew were not informers who lived around the corner. And we said, we told them about this and we said, listen, we're really thinking of getting some stuff down there so as he, if they came to arrest him, he mm -hmm. could go down there. But then they might take me because they had done that before. They'd come to arrest mm -hmm. a husband, he had gone. Mm. And they took the wife. Mm. And so I said, you must keep your eyes open because he, he can't mm. get out of there once it's done. But he eventually realized that he wasn't able to do what he yeah. wanted to do. Yeah. And he, and he came was... up with the idea of leaving. Yeah. He had made a couple of trips or one yeah. trip to raise money and yeah. raise conscience. I mean, he went to yes, Parliament, to the Senate, to the House of Representatives, the President. He went all over to yeah. tell them what was happening. Yeah. Again, because there was no internet. So he came home one night. Oh no, you changed your citizenship, right? Yes. He realized finally yes. that you could get... Changed it to English. Right. Because we could both Britain. get English passports. Uh -huh. And um, we had to discuss this always Outside. by walking yeah. around the neighborhood. Um, nothing in the house was ever discussed. And one day he came home and he said, listen, is a plane, I'm leaving. And I said, you cannot leave without saying goodbye to the children. He's leaving that night. Yes. And um, I rushed around collecting them, and he put some things together, and off we went. To the airport. And it was lucky. He wasn't sure he was going to get through, was he? No, he wasn't sure because there had been a message from someone in Pretoria where the documents were to say, oh, we got your whatever it was, your landing strip or your this or that or the other. And he wondered whether the people who were listening to yeah. the calls. That's why he went that night. Yeah. Now, what happened to you? You were left there with four children. Yes, but that's OK, All because right. I got a, a letter to <laughs> say you had a month to leave. Oh, you got well, that was fine. I didn't yeah, want to stay month. anyway. Listen, right. I didn't, I never wanted to right. stay. Oh, you always wanted to leave. I wanted to leave. Ah. I just figured this was no place to bring up kids. Ah. So um, we that's did. so interesting. So you we flew did. to, you, you had a month. What did you do with your house? We just, we left it there, and a friend, a very close friend of mine, you know, saw yeah. that it was sold uh -huh. for not as much as we would have gotten if we were there, but so what? And you left all your furniture? Oh, we left everything, everything. there. Um, yeah, because there was no way you could take that. And uh, then you we came here. So you flew to England and then you flew here? Well, we flew to Israel first. To Israel. Where my, I had a big family there. Mm -hmm. And they did their best to, you know, to or get us to stay. And I said, no way. I'm going to America, the land of the free. 
<laughs> and let me tell you one thing that happened. We arrived at midnight, and somebody was there from the consul's office with green cards. Uh, I had absolutely no idea what this meant. I just said, thanks so much, but you know, I can't stop to talk to you because I've got all these kids here. Yeah. I had no idea, and afterwards I realized yeah. that... Um, but you're lucky also to get in here and... Well, because Joel had known the consul and yeah. he'd been very helpful with a lot of his cases. So, well, we've come to the end of the story, and I'm sure there are many more things we could talk about. But the courage that you display was, is just so Ronnie, unbelievable. It's <laughs> not courage. You do it, otherwise you can't really live there. Yeah. What's the point of not making the world just and we things did. are right? You I did. wish there was yeah. time for one more thing to tell you. Yeah. Well, another time you're yeah. going to come back and because visit. that was good. And I'm sure there are other books, but this is a great book, and you have to look on Amazon to get it. But it tells you about the cases, so you get the other side of it. Oh. And it's, uh, it's a very interesting book. And Jeanette, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for being <laughs> interested. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.